Welcome to Computational Finance 101. Over the next nine minutes, you're going to gain a foundation from the ground up in data science techniques, risk and return modeling, data visualization, and more. Whether it's your first time ever dealing with financial concepts inside of a programming language, or you just want to brush up on the basics, you're in the right spot. Let's get started. First, we're going to import the most widely used numerical library in Python, NumPy. We're also going to import a NumPy wrapper called Pandas that we're going to use to hold our data, as well as matplotlib, which we'll use for data visualization. To import data into Pandas, we can use the read CSV function and hand it either a path to a local file or a URL to a remote hosted resource. In this video, we're going to use a Python library called yfinance to fetch our data, which will put it into a Pandas data structure for us. Let's go ahead and download monthly stock prices for the ETF SPY. Adjusted close gives us closing prices that are inclusive of cash flows, so we aren't leaving any data out. This way, returns will be calculated as total returns as opposed to price returns. There's two different pandas data structures that we can use to store our data, being series and data frames. A series is single dimensional and can be used for data from a single stock, while a data frame is two dimensional and can be used to store data from multiple stocks. In this video, we're going to go ahead and stick with data frames. In cases where we have NA values, like we do in this case because the two different stocks have different inception dates, we can remove all rows with an NA by calling the drop NA method. When applicable, the inPlace parameter can be used to perform the operations on the existing data frame as opposed to returning a new one. What we have now is called a price series because we have prices at consecutive time steps. Let's take a closer look at our data frame. This date column is special and is known as our index. We can change the format of our index to monthly to match the granularity of the data with the two period method. We can now go ahead and plot our prices with matplotlib by calling dot plot on our data frame. This doesn't actually help us perform any type of comparison as our prices start at two different arbitrary points as this is just raw ETF data at the moment. We'll be seeing how to correct this shortly. When it comes to calculating returns from these prices, let's go over some basic math first. The most common return formula that you've probably been taught is where you take the difference in final price and the initial price of an asset and scale it by the initial price. This gives you a single period return expressed as a decimal, which you can then convert into a percentage. When it comes to computational finance, it's going to be helpful to slightly modify the standard formula. If we divide the final price by the initial price, we are left with the exact same number, but larger by one. If we then subtract one, we have the exact same result. This is called the one plus R format, and it's going to be a reoccurring theme. All of that was for a single period return. To calculate a multi-period return, we can add 1 to each single period return, multiply them all together, and then subtract 1. This is known as a compound or a geometric return. It's important to note that in order to calculate the compound return, which is the real return, you cannot just add the returns together due to something called variance drag. Essentially, if you invest $100 into an asset and earn 30% in time step 1, that's 30% of $100. If you then lose 30% in time step 2, that's 30% of $130, which is $39. The process outlined here is called geometric linking. If you want to go ahead and turn this price series into a return series, we can take a little shortcut and simply call the percent change method rather than using the previous formula. When converting from prices to returns though, you will always lose a single data point as returns cannot be computed for the first day as previous closing prices are not available. We can then use the drop NA method to clean this up and we now have a return series. If you want to see how our returns look, we can once again plot this with dot plot. If we now want to compound the entire return series, we can add one to all of our single period returns call dot prod, which will calculate the product between all of them, and then subtract one. If you want to view this more clearly, we can round this and apply the dot as type method to change the numbers to strings. These are now our in-sample compound returns. Coming back to some more data frame methods, we can view the first five or n elements with dot head. The same is applicable for dot tail. If you want to view the total number of elements in the data frame, we can use dot size. And if you want to view the size of each individual axis, we can use dot shape. We also have dot index to view our dates and dot columns to view our stocks. We can index into a single stock with single brackets and get a series or any number of stocks with double brackets to keep it as a data frame. We can also index across rows with dot lock given an index or dot iloc for integer location given the position of an index. 
Both of these methods also work with a colon operator for slicing if you want to select a range. Turning to the risk side of things now, let's go ahead and calculate the volatility measured by standard deviation. We know that standard deviation is just a square root of variance. Once again, we can shorthand the underlying mathematics by using the dot STD method. Now that we know how to calculate returns and volatility, let's move on to annualizing both of these metrics, as this is what we actually use to analyze performance. Let's start by calculating annualized return. We know that if we had a single monthly return, we could annualize it by merely raising it to the 12th power, as this would be equivalent to a compound return over a 12-month period. In reality though, we have a return series with hundreds or thousands of different per-period returns. What we can do is work our way backward. If we have a single monthly return, we could add one to it, raise it to the 12th power, and then subtract the one. If you want to work backward and calculate this monthly return, we would need to raise our entire sample's compound return to 1 over the number of periods, where the compound growth is as we have calculated it before, and the number of periods can be determined with its shape. We can actually do some shorthand here and raise the compound growth to the periods per year over the number of periods. Let's put this into a function where periods per year can be parametric. Annualized volatility, on the other hand, is going to be much easier, as we can just multiply your volatility by the square root of the periods per year. Let's go ahead and put this into its own function as well. While we're at it, we can calculate the raw sharp ratio, which is just a risk-adjusted return measure. To calculate the raw sharp ratio, we can just scale our annualized returns by our annualized volatility. To calculate the actual sharp ratio, this would require a time series of T-bill returns, also known as the risk-free rate, which will be covered in an upcoming video. If you want to now use a return series to create a wealth index, we can just add one to all of our returns, but rather than calling .prod, we can call .cumprod, which calculates the cumulative product, which is just the running product at each successive timestamp. We can now see an accurate comparison between securities. This also represents the growth of $1. Something to note is that the wealth index doesn't actually start at 1, because the first data point represents the first day's return. If you want to insert a static 1 as the first data point in our wealth index, we can take our start date with .index.min, cycle to the previous month with pd.date offset, and then prepend this into the data frame with pd.concat. For our last topic, let's calculate and plot our drawdowns. Drawdowns are just going to be the return from the previous peak to the current price. We're going to use the wealth index to help us calculate drawdowns in conjunction with the previous peaks, which can be calculated by calling .qmax on the wealth index. Qmax is just a cumulative maximum, which will set each value equal to the highest data point on or before each respective time step. To arrive at our drawdowns, we can take the difference between our wealth index and our previous peaks and scale it by our previous peaks. This is now our drawdowns. A key stat that is often calculated would be the maximum drawdown, which we can calculate by calling dot min, since our numbers are negative. Lastly, we can call dot idx min, or index minimum, to get the date associated with the maximum drawdown. If you want to plot all of this together, we can add in a matplotlib annotation, where we format the max drawdown, give it coordinates, position it, and add in an arrow. This now turns all of this code that might be hard to wrap your head around into a nice data visualization. If you enjoyed, I might make this video the first in a series which would include a wide range of topics spanning from stochastic modeling and portfolio insurance to asset pricing and factor regressions. If you liked the video, consider leaving a thumbs up, as well as any additional feedback or ways it can improve. Thanks for watching.